Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We open our program from Oakland at Lake Merritt at the site of a memorial for those who died in the ghost ship warehouse fire. The flowers, notes, and candles here symbolize the immense grief being felt across the Bay Area and the nation. In the week since the catastrophic blaze claims 36 lives, many questions remain. How many other warehouse spaces are there like this? And how safe are they? Who should be held accountable? And what can be done to prevent something like this from happening again? Investigators and city officials are continuing their work. But for the many people who lost friends or family members, their grief is still overwhelming. I'm here in Oakland to talk to members of the arts community about how this tragedy is affecting them and to remember some of the artists we have lost. Russell Butler is a local musician who was preparing to perform at the Ghost Ship Warehouse moments before the fire broke out. Russell, I know that you were at the site of the Ghost Ship uh, when the fire happened. Can you take us back to that night? What was going on? A lot of my friends were going to get together and just do what we love the most. There was a concert going on and people were there to celebrate art. Celebrate art and to celebrate each other. And you were going to perform. You had set up your gear. And where were you when the fire broke out? I was outside uh, next to the door. What did you see? What did you hear when the fire broke out? You can't talk about it. I understand. I lost a lot of people, and they were all the best people. This is one of the reasons why this is especially hard. Um, it's not just the building or the loss of life in general. Or, these people were pillars. Like These people really held a lot of people up. Um, I, was, I, I feel very blessed to have been able to call them friends. Can you tell us about one or two of them and what are your fondest memories of them, what they were like? I think of, think of someone like Johnny, Johnny Egas. Whenever you saw him, he'd always be smiling and think about Cash a lot. I was really just stunned by her. She was someone who was so young but already clearly knew who they were. This has been such a difficult week for so many people. Um, and as you reflect and look forward, um, what are you hoping will come out of all this? I really hope this brings communities together to advocate for those of us in the arts communities and those of us who are people of color and queer and trans and the most marginalized and the most vulnerable. After talking with Russell Butler, I headed to the Vintage Synthesizer Museum in Oakland to meet with three others who lost friends in the fire. John Lady is a musician. Jonah Strauss is a musician and a sound engineer. Brendan Draper is a sound engineer and manages local bands. Thank you all for being with us. Um, I know it's been a really tough week. Could each of you tell us uh, about someone that you lost in the fire and you would like to share a memory of? Two people I lost were uh, Ben Reynolds and Donalda. They were in a band called Intro Flirt, who I worked with for the last two years about. I'm just gonna miss their complete honesty about you know every situation we were in, whether it was good or bad. Both of them had like a personal philosophy to kind of like experience whatever feeling you're feeling in the moment, you know, whether that be like sadness, happiness, social anxiety, you know, all that, ever, the whole range. I lost Kiyomi Tanaway. She was a tireless facilitator of the arts, selflessly putting herself out there to make everyone feel like they had a place and a space and a community to, to do whatever they wanted. And she was incredibly infectious to be around. And Ara Jo, it was, Everyone was close with her. Everyone knew what she was doing f for the community. Everyone knew that she was so capable of working with everyone constantly. She would be cutting someone's hair, giving someone like um, a tattoo, making an, a illustration, and all the while running door at a show, making people um, dinner 
literally simultaneously all this stuff had happened and no one knew how she did it. I think everybody should know about Billy Dixon because that was one undercover dude. In addition to being a, a brilliant DJ and beatboxer with an encyclopedic knowledge of hip hop, um, Billy had a, an electronic production technique that was unparalleled and utterly unique. Um, he, he would use antiquated technology in ways that that technology was never used in the first place. And I was wildly impressed with his production skills. I own a tape machine that he sold me, and I'm going to love it and cherish it forever. I wish he was still around. So what's the effect of this loss on the art scene in Oakland, would you say? I mean, I think the effect, it wasn't just one or two people. Um, they were all sort of like an artery that's been like ruptured that you, is just kind of bleeding out right now. And people are inspired in ways that they've never been inspired before to um, build upon that morning and like just own it and redirect it into so much more mm -hmm. um, work with each other than I think we've ever seen. The ghost ship was a warehouse, was not intended to be a residence. A number of people eventually did live there. Was the ghost ship an outlier or is it indicative of a lot of unsafe places like that? Well, thanks for using the word outlier because that's the, you, you really hit the nail on the head. Um, <clears throat> the ghost ship was by far the most unsafe space I've ever heard of or seen that was DIY built in Oakland. I've been in countless, where I literally countless warehouse spaces, and I've never seen anything like that. I saw pictures from before the fire. I've spoken with many friends who have been in there, and um, it, it's not just the media reports. It was totally an unsafe space. I can't, I can't support that kind of build out. Um, every build out that I've either uh, been a part of or been privy to in multiple cities um, has been built with m much greater eye towards safety first and code second. Uh, the city of Oakland is under pressure from uh, uh, both local and, and national and international news media and a lot of NIMBY type folks to crack down on warehouses. And so what happens is uh, a space will get red tagged and then it gives the landlord uh, free reign to do whatever they want with the building. They can pay off their fines and they can uh, attempt to rehabilitate the building immediately or they can stall for three years until all, the, all of the tenants go away and relinquish their rights to return um, and then rebuild it as condos. This is a housing crisis. Uh, we are fighting a battle and we want to not lose the war. Everybody knows that our rents in Oakland are second to San Francisco, which is second to Manhattan. A lot of people are already fighting to keep their spaces that are exponentially safer. We're put in a position to where sometimes we have to just perform and facilitate each other's art in our in our own home. It's been going on for so long that this is this is our livelihood. This is where we gather. This is where we support each other. And if we don't have that, then we have next to nothing. Meanwhile, a lot of attention is still focused on the ghost ship, um, and there are questions now about who should be held accountable. Who do you think should be held responsible for what happened there? I would love it if the t city took some responsibility for this. I would love it if uh, Libby Schaff uh, would take some public responsibility for this. I mean, uh, you know, I like the people at the building department. I've had a lot of interactions with them. Um, I think that they're not given the resources to do what they have to do in the way that they should really be doing it, if that makes sense. It's not give them more money and power to shut spaces down. It's give the city the resources, and that includes social workers working within the embedded within the building department uh, to reach out to uh, spaces and talk about what people's actual needs are on, on the ground. If the city actually cares about its residents, it will, uh, it will perform a complete overhaul of the way that the building department functions, uh, and uh, that's gonna have to come from Mayor Schaff herself, not a $1.7 million arts grant to fund exclusively established nonprofits who have nice spaces downtown. If you're not recognizing the housing crisis, whether or not you call it a crisis, it, people being displaced who have endured and made Oakland what it is in these spaces is not, it's not going to hold the city together.
are there enough spaces in Oakland for performers like you and others to do your work, show your work, um, and that are affordable? Actually, believe it or not, I think that there are enough spaces for us to do our work and show our work, but the problem is that those spaces are under such duress. If we can find a way to get those spaces under less duress, find a what way to... What do you mean by that, under duress? Um, we cannot talk to the city. We can't, we can't just uh, tell, them, tell them that we exist. Uh, because the only mechanisms, excuse me, the only mechanisms that are in place right now are either you operate uh, completely under cover of darkness, uh, even if you have formal businesses running out of your space, or uh, you get shut down. It's, it's, it's very black and white. You uh, get shut down because of building codes? Yes, you... yeah, it's just, it's just very, it's basically nobody snitches. And uh, it's a ridiculous way to live. And in, in, in some way that, duress um, breeds really good creativity, but I would much rather creativity bred in the community by having spaces that everybody feels comfortable and safe in and know aren't going to get shut down. If people in the world at large are truly concerned with supporting the arts in Oakland, help us buy a building. You know, help us buy the building that we're already in. Let's take it out of the hands of greedy landlords. Sorry, mostly greedy landlords, not all of them. Um, and let's put it into the hands of the artists. Help us pass our uh, our fire code inspections. Uh, help us, uh, you know, look at the spaces that we're already in and see how to improve them. It's not that we need different spaces. It's that we need to make our spaces solvent. We are operating undercover, and to operate undercover is to be completely out or for the most part off the radar and out of the 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 biggest goal like Jonah said the like you know owning a building finding ways for the city to to recognize what that can do for Oakland what that can do for the artists that are already living there who have invested so much of their own money trying to make it safe and trying to make it viable. And again, like, there's something to be said for people who are welcoming people in, into, their, into their homes to share what they've made with them and to have them share what they made with, with the city. And I'd invite the mayor, I'd invite whoever I could to actually like, come to one of these events and really take in what, what it's about, because I think there's a, a great deal of um, like naivety to what is act, what's actually happening in the space. And aside from the politics of it, there, there are people who are developing opinions that really just don't know. So where do you think we should go from here? Going from here, I mean, I would just hope that everyone who is creating music, creating art and stuff in Oakland, like just keeps on doing it, but I hope that, you know, on both sides, especially in the housing debate and from the city and from the people running spaces that people do, like, meet in the middle. The other uh, really important thing that I think everyone in the Bay needs to focus on is a vast portion of the Oakland artistic community are black folks, brown folks, transgendered folks, queer folks, poor folks. Um, all of these uh, people who rank less high on the privilege scale, who um, are even at even greater risk than people who look like we do um, at uh, losing their homes, losing their voices, losing their uh, places to express their art. And I think that moving forward, um, not only does the discussion need to focus on how uh, to keep Oakland artists in Oakland and off the streets, um, but specifically how to make sure uh, that the transgendered and uh, folks of color, uh, people in our community are supported appropriately. Do you feel pessimistic or do you feel hopeful that something positive might come out of this? I feel 110 percent optimistic. We knew that there was going to be an outpouring of support from each other, but we weren't expecting everyone to be as invigorated as it's, it's, there's no words for what's being, what's happening right now and how confident people are moving forward that they want to really honor their friends' memories and the only way like we all know that the only way to do that is to make it okay for these for this community to continue doing what it's doing. 
we've gotten a lot stronger as a community. That's one thing that has really come out of this. It's, it's, we don't even say hello to each other anymore on the street. Everybody just embraces. You don't ask how you're doing. I know how you're doing. You know how I'm doing. Terrible. But we're sticking together, and we're sticking together through every, uh, every means necessary. Well, on that note of unity and hope and coming together, we want to thank you for your time. I know it's been a really difficult week, and our condolences are with you and your loss. John, Brendan, and Jonah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was Tui Vu reporting in Oakland. The tragedy at the Ghost Ship Warehouse highlighted some of the pressures that artists face in the Bay Area, including high housing prices. Of course, the housing crisis affects many others, too, including college students. In fact, a new study from San Diego State University found that one third of all community college students are either homeless or living on the edge of being unable to afford housing. For a closer look, I'm joined now by KQED reporter Laura Clivens. She's been looking into problems faced by homeless college students. And UC Berkeley undergrad Taylor Lorraine Harvey. She started the Homeless Student Union at Cal. Welcome to both of you. you. Taylor, let me begin with you. Why did you feel a need to start the Homeless Student Union? I think that students identified a discrepancy between the resources for food insecurity and housing insecurity. A number of students that I was familiar with came into housing insecurity or homelessness and found that there were a number of faculty that didn't know how to approach them or deal with the situation um, and that there was a lot of lack of support for those students and so it was kind of in an effort to support ourselves and start to form solutions to help ourselves. So would you say a lack of support from the administration or just they didn't really know how to help? I think it was both. I think that um, a lot of faculty and administration and staff and professors didn't know how to talk to the students who were suffering from these conditions. I think that there were a lack of concrete resources for these students. I think there were a lack of solutions. Um, and I think that the students didn't really know what to do, and so we started this to help ourselves. And what's your situation with regard to housing? I've been homeless or housing insecure since I was about 13. Um, I suffered from homelessness during the last three years of high school, um, and I stayed with a kind family who agreed to take me in until I graduated or until I graduated high school and got into college. This is down my, in San Diego? Down in San Diego um, for my senior year and part of my junior year. Laura, you've been doing this reporting. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you set out to find and how difficult, what were some of the difficulties you encountered finding students so yeah. willing to talk with you? Yeah, it was actually one of the hardest stories that we've had in finding subjects to talk to, um, which was surprising for all of us. I worked on this story with two other reporters. Um, and so what we ended up doing was we really blitzed all these college campuses trying to get folks to respond to us. Um, and I, you know, eventually found Taylor. Um, luckily, Taylor's in this situation where she's housed right now. And so like what you told me when we were talking was that she feels okay talking, but so many of the other people do not because they are sleeping in places that are not allowed, like um, campus buildings, um, or they're just, they have so much going on logistically in their lives. Is there an element also of just like, I don't, I don't want to put a word in their mouths, but sh like shame, uh, you know, that they, mm -hmm. that they don't have housing, Taylor? Yeah, I think that there's a huge stigmatization around it. I think that their peers sort of don't understand it or don't think that it exists. I think that's really the hugest problem is that a lot of people on campus in the com campus community don't really realize that this happens. And so it's not really like talked about. And so there's this kind of silence around the whole issue as well as like a sort of shame. Yeah, people are worried. Right. I yeah. think it's definitely a hidden issue. Um, and when we try to find people, I think part of not identifying as homeless, part of it's for preservation of your own pride. Um, I spoke to a few people who were well into their 20s before they looked back on their teenage years or their college experience and realized that they were homeless, but they wouldn't have used that word at the time. And, and yeah. what's the difference between homeless and housing insecure? You're just like sort of couch surfing or you're not sure where you're going to be living from month to month? Well, I think that's also an issue of people not knowing like how to identify as homeless because I think that boundary is unclear. Um, there are a number of factors that make you housing insecure, including like rent being over 40% of your income or overcrowding because the landlord can come in and kick you out at any time um, and also just like having no savings um, which is like the situation that I'm in um, I'm like currently living somewhere that's really nice and I'm able to afford rent but if I 
like for some reason have an extra expense like my laptop gets stolen or something, I will not be able to afford yeah. rent the next month. And Laura, I know one of the students you met in profile was Brittany Jones. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about her and you know what her life was like as you spent time yeah. with her. Sure, yeah. It was an amazing experience to meet her. Um, she, I feel like her life is all about logistics and details. Um, knowing when BART opens, knowing where you can charge your phone, knowing that you get food vouchers here or there, knowing that the showers at this one place are open at this time. What's the importance of knowing when BART opens? Oh, so, so for her, she will go and rest on BART. Um, so often, if she doesn't have a place to stay overnight, she'll go to BART right as it opens up and basically sleep on BART until the rush hour crowd comes in. And she's a student at, is it Laney? She's a student at Laney College, which is a community college right by Lake Merritt. Um, and so it was great getting to know her, and I think one of the things that I really took away from meeting her was despite not having much of a safety net and a support system around her, um, she really had this incredible level of resilience I internally. Like the way she had to talk to herself um, was a very positive one. Well, and Taylor, I would think that, uh, I mean, it's hard for any college student under the best of circumstances, especially freshman year, you know, you're getting adjusted to being away from home, it can be expensive, all kinds of grade pressures, and then you add on top of that this housing insecurity or homelessness. I mean, it takes a special kind of person to live through that and pursue a college education, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that I was privileged enough, I guess somewhat, to have been through this already before I came to college. And so I developed the tactical knowledge and I developed the skills and I developed the ability to stay resilient and to motivate myself. How did um, you develop that? Um, trial and error, I guess, um, through being tried and tried again, um, a lot of work, a lot of exhaustion, um, a lot of like sleepless nights. Um, I would have to take the bus for like three and a half hours to get to school at some points, and I would just remember that like college was my only way out of this cycle, um, and so that was my primary motivator. Um, and then I finally got to UC Berkeley, and I found that I still had to keep working and still had to keep fighting, and that was I think the hardest part. Laura, to what extent do we know sort of the demographics of who these students are, where they're from? I mean, it would be easy to stereotype, uh, but I imagine they come from all parts of the state and country probably, and world for that matter. T tell us what you know about that. Yeah, they do. I mean, when we have spoken with experts and we've reached out to these students that we ended up finding, people really came from different backgrounds. Um, all genders, all ethnicities, all races. Um, Is there a commonality? There are some commonalities. So um, a lot of individuals who are former foster youth find themselves in this situation again. Um, LGBTQ youth um, who may have been rejected and no longer supported by their families of origin. And then um, among the homeless young population, unaccompanied minors actually are some that end up in shelters here in the United States. From like Central America yes. and, mm -hmm. and Mexico, south yeah. of the border. Yeah, right. And Taylor, what, what does the union, your student union, advocate for? What do you want from the university and how responsive are they? Well, um, we started really just not knowing like how to approach the idea, and so we fostered a lot of creative solutions via just like conversations. Um, we kind of are pushing for um, an emergency housing fund, as well as like an emergency housing location in case homeless students were to arise and uh, contact faculty, they could just be referred there. Um, those are just immediate solutions. Um, but we've also been approached by a number of people from the community. I think just the fact that we exist has given us an opportunity to curate resources rather than create them. And so I'm a contact person to refer to other resources. And I think just the fact that we exist is a testament to the fact that this is a problem. The other thing that I wanted to circle back to that Taylor mentioned was that um, your understanding was that it, going to college would be something that got you out of that situation in high school. Mm -hmm. and, and I think some people, when we've been reporting this story, have asked us, well, it doesn't really make sense to go to, to college right now when really maybe you should just be working or look into a vocational career. Mm -hmm. And every young person that we spoke with, um, they had a, a very similar feeling to what you've expressed, is that they've experienced economic hardship in the past, and so now now they're really hoping to get what is now socially pretty pretty needed to get ahead and get an affordable uh, wage. To what extent does financial aid, I mean UC talks about how much financial aid they give to students for tuition and living costs, I mean to what extent does that not cover uh, the cost of housing? 
um, there was actually a statistic that was just released that um, rent is underestimated by financial aid by 42 percent. Um, and so I have just enough personally to pay for just rent. I have to pay for utilities and food on my own, which means I worked about 20 to, 20 to 40 hours a week a week to do that and also have a savings um, in case something were to happen. I need some kind of safety net, even though I don't really have one in general. Yeah. And Laura, what do, what do you hope people take away from the reporting that you and others at KQED are doing on this? Mm -hmm. I think just that this is an issue because I think the reason why a lot of campuses are not acting is because they're just seeing that it's a problem. We've just seen studies come out about the actual numbers and looking at the gaps or what exists presently and it's very piecemeal, the approach. Um, so just that there's more of a focus on a, a task force or more long term, term and short, short term solutions. As, yeah. um, what would you add to that, Taylor? What do, you, what, do you, what do you want people to know? Uh, that they may not know about homeless students and housing insecure students. Yeah, I think to underscore the fact that they exist and the fact that we're currently working on a much different playing field than everyone else. Um, it's difficult to get ahead in classes and to like apply to grad school and take those tests when we can't even figure out where we're going to sleep that night or figure out what we're going to eat the next day. Um, and so it's we're working with a lot more obstacles than other students and it's hard to understand why we're on the same curve. Yeah. All right, Taylor Lorraine Harvey, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Laura Clivens, thanks for your reporting, and let's yeah. hope lots of people hear about it and Thank pay you, attention. Scott. Thank you, Thank you. That's it for our show tonight, and for more of our coverage, go to kqed.org slash newsroom. Before we go, we'd like to end with a song from Donalda, Nicole, Renee, and Ben Runnels, two young musicians who died in the ghost ship fire. They performed in a band called Intro Flirt. I'm Scott Schaefer. Good night.